Are you blessed? What a blessing. Listen, Bartimaeus heard that Jesus was passing by and he said, Son of David, have mercy on me. That is the only prayer he prayed. Son of David, have mercy on me. The Bible says Jesus stopped just for that prayer. And Jesus turned and asked the man to come. We know the rest of the story. Bartimaeus was healed. His side was restored. Because of a simple prayer, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The mercy of God will locate somebody this morning. Amen. And the mercy of God will turn everything around this morning. Amen. See, the Bible was written for our instructions. You can just see something in the Bible, if you understand it, and you can apply it for yourself. And you will have the same result. Why don't you lift your hands and say, Jesus, have mercy on me this morning. I need your mercy this morning. I need mercy to speak on my behalf this morning. The issues of my life require your mercy. Your mercy, your mercy. Father, let your mercy locate us this morning. Let your mercy locate us this morning. We are not standing here on our own rights. We are not standing here and we are not even praying because we deserve it, Lord. But your mercy, your mercy, your mercy can locate somebody this morning and turn everything around and turn everything around. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Do not pass me by. Do not pass me by. Have mercy on me. I believe in the mercy of God. The Bible says his mercies are new every morning. Even this morning, the mercies of God are being renewed for you. Maybe you used mercy yesterday. Maybe you used mercy last year. But this morning, the son of David will show you mercy again. Will show you mercy again. Undeserved favor. He will show you mercy again. He'll, his help will come your way. In the name of Jesus. 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 Father, have mercy on somebody this morning. Somebody needs your mercy. Let your mercy speak. Let your mercy speak. Let your mercy speak in that situation. Let your mercy speak in that situation. It requires a miracle. It requires a miracle. But your mercy is enough. Your mercy is enough. Your mercy is enough. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Do not let me in the hands of my invisible enemies. Do not let me in the hands of my enemies. Have mercy on me. Somebody is praying. Somebody is praying. Somebody is praying for the mercy. Oh, yes, Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Thank you, Father. We receive mercy. We receive grace from above. We receive help from above. We receive assistance from above. We receive grace from above. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name, we have given thanks. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You can take your seat in the presence of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being online. Thank you for coming to listen to this word. I believe God will do something for you today. Something that you will live to remember. I want to thank everybody that supported the Fearless Conference 2023 that took place last week, Friday. It was a blessing. It was a great time in the presence of the Lord. We had such a wonderful time. And I believe that our lives shall never remain the same because our capacity is being increased and is being built. Hallelujah. You can never remain the same person in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Then this morning is Father's Day. And we want to honor all our fathers this morning. The fathers and the future fathers. The soon-to-be fathers. You are in the line for it. A father is a blessing. Of all the titles that our Heavenly Father has, I think the one he's more fond of is the one of a father. He's El Shaddai, he's Adonai, he's Elohim. But the one he relates with the most is Father, Abba. Because a father is a blessing. 
Jesus never addressed God as El Shaddai, as Elohim. He addressed him as my father. The whole time he was on earth, he introduced God to us as a father. So to all the fathers out there, I want to say we honor you. You are a blessing. You are a blessing. You might not live up to our expectations. But the good thing is, you're not supposed to. You don't have to. You are answerable to God alone, not to your children. And I pray that you will be a good father. Amen. Hallelujah. John 8, 49, Jesus answered, I do not have a demon. I honor my father. I do not have a demon, but I honor my father. Evil spirits are always involved where there's dishonor. Dishonor is never just the result of bad attitudes or poor upbringing. More often than not, dishonor is the result of evil spirits. Are you listening to me? Now, we've been talking about defeating Invisible enemies. I'm laying a foundation on this topic. I know it's going to require more knocks before the ground will break. But the time is going to come where such subject will be so well understood in our ministry with evidence and testimonies and miracles. You must understand that we are just putting into place the doctrinal systems that our children, and our, ourselves and our children are supposed to live by. And I'm so blessed that these things are being recorded and kept. Tomorrow somebody might want to come back to it and be blessed. Praise the name of Jesus. Look, the first week I introduced you to invisible enemies and I made you aware that there are things fighting you that you do not have a clear understanding of. A lot of them. Paul says, a great and effectual door is open to me and there are many adversaries. Your enemies are not few. There are many. There are many. Just because you don't know them doesn't mean they don't exist. Most of them are invisible. That's why you think you don't have enemies. But you actually have a lot of enemies. I know everybody laughed when they see you. Everybody smiles when you pass around. And you feel very loved. You feel so accepted. But what you don't understand is that that is a mirage. Do you know what is a mirage? Check your dictionary. A mirage is not the truth you actually have many adversaries. Yeah. You do. And I've been taking you through them. So you to understand, to at least become aware. And last week we hit a very, very heavy one. You know, a subject that is not really, you know, spoken much about in the church. And in fact, church people are so much victim of it every day. But your days of being victim of witchcraft have come to an end. Amen. Yes. And I want you to understand, the things I'm teaching in one, like one hour, ten minutes, one hour, you cannot tell me that in one hour, ten minutes, you have understood everything about the subject of witchcraft. You should not take your own self and start studying the thing deeper so that you can access things that pastor couldn't say in one hour. It's a mistake for you to think I mean, some of you don't even listen to it a second time to start with. You are just feeling, no, no, no. Pastor, you say something very important there, and I think it's true. It's a mistake. If I were you, I would take my time on that subject. I would find books. Because you might find out that that is actually the main area Satan has been molesting you. Because that's the area you never thought 
something like that can happen. You see? This morning, we want to look at something else. Exposing invisible enemies in relationships. You want to look at that? You want to look at that? Because Jesus says, I do not have a demon. I honor my father. So the relationship of Jesus with his father was intact. And Jesus revealed what could have been the cause of that relationship not working. If a demon was allowed in that relationship, that relationship was going to be destroyed. He says, I honor my father. In other words, the flow between me and my father is still in place. I relate well with my father. And the reason for that is because if you check, there's no demon here. No evil spirit has been allowed in. That's why my relationship with my father is flowing. So because it's Father's Day, I think it's very, very important that we address the issue of how relationships are destroyed by invisible enemies because a demon is something you cannot see. Yet Jesus is mentioning that if that thing was allowed in his relationship with his father, he was not going to have a good relationship with his father. Let me start by first saying that our God is a God of relationships. You need to know that God values relationships. Let us make man. Let us. Let us. God seems to not do things alone. He's always involved with a team. If you read about heaven, he has millions of angels all around him. He has 24 elders. He has all kinds of things always. He seems to want people around. He's a God of relationships. John 10 verse 30, I and my father are one. Jesus is speaking. He says, I and my father are one. I don't know if we can say the same today in many areas. I and my husband are one. I and my children are one. I and my manager are one. I and my teacher are one. I and my pastor are one. You will notice that a lot of our relationship, we cannot make this statement. It's a simple line. I and my father are one. In 1 John 4 verse 8, the Bible says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. I'm trying to tell you that our God is a God of relationships. So John is saying that if you don't love, you don't know God. And we know very well that love is defined Relationships are defined mostly by love. And God does not have love. He is love. It's important to notice that. Are you with me? I'm just laying my little foundation first. All right? Now, man was created to relate with God. In fact, God already had a spiritual family, which were angels, archangels, you know, seraphims, you know, and cherubims and all of that. But God needed another type of family, no more in the spiritual realm, but in the physical realm. That is actually the purpose of your existence. That, because you might ask, why did God create us? God wanted another kind of family. He already had the spiritual world, everything there was under his control. But he wanted to now conquer the physical realm, the realm that we can see. But he didn't want to conquer it and to be there and reign there himself. He wanted to put a representative of himself there. So he will rule that realm through his representation. Are you listening to what I'm saying? That's why he created you. So he created you so that through you, he can rule the physical realm. That was the whole purpose. So that's why he made you in his image and in his likeness so that you will have the capacity to represent him well wherever he had placed you. Are you listening to me? Are you listening? 
So man was therefore supposed to continuously relate with God so that he can receive capacity to rule this realm. That's why he needed to continuously be in, really, in good relationship with his father, his maker, his creator. Psalm 8 verse 4, the Bible says, What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him. Visitation talks of relationships. It's a relationship. Mindful of him. So God is constantly thinking about man. Constantly thinking about man. So you see that God intended that you and, and him should relate very, very well. Not what has happened today. Man was supposed to relate well with his wife. The Bible says in Genesis 2 verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good for man, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. This was God initiating marriages, relationships at a high, a new level. No, already man was with him. Man was relating with God. But now God wanted man to also relate with man. So he created a woman. He said man shouldn't be alone. Never forget that statement. It is not good for man to be alone. Every time you are alone, one of the signs of demonic activity is isolation. That is one of the number one things that you must remember is that Satan is a separatist. He divides. God unites, he divides. Never forget that. Man was supposed to relate with his biological family. So God created him, man. He related with man. Then he created a woman to relate with man. Then he now, through the woman, then a family starts. Then you start having family, family relations. All of that. Are you understanding that? Man is working on relation. He wants you to relate. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Psalm 68 verse 6. God set the lonely in families. God set the lonely in families. Never ever think you are in that family by mistake. God set you there. Why? To answer the problem of loneliness in your life. Your biological family is playing a role. Without them, you will not be here. Because when you were born, they are the ones who were, you know, washing you, cleansing you, doing these things for you. That's why you are here. They've played a role. Don't undermine it. Then God also gave you a spiritual family. In the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 47, the Bible says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. But I want you to understand that God set the lonely in families, biologically, then God is now adding to the church those that are being saved. Are you saved? If you are saved and you don't have a local church, then I don't think you are saved because salvation, the complete salvation is when God adds you to a church. You must be added to a church. And when you are part of a church, it is not just an accident that happened. It is God who set you in that church. That God has added you to a number in a church. It, be, it means God believes every believer is supposed to belong to a church. I mean, why would God add you to something if it doesn't matter. In Jeremiah 3 verse 8, 15, says, I will give you pastors according to my heart who shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. So God asks you to a church and then God gives you a pastor. God asks you to a family and then God gives you family relations. I can see and you can see with me that God is a God of relationships. Please understand that about him. This isolation, this exclusion mentality and behavioral pattern that a lot of us have is not consistent with the nature of God. That's not how God relates. That's not how God is. And if you are like him, made in his image, then there should be a letters. A letters. Letters. Let us. 
Why is it always with you? Let me. Let me. Let me. When are you going to say, let us? Let us. Let us. I see you becoming wise in your relationship. And, and I hope you realize that for each one of these relationships I've just mentioned to you, and Satan has attacked each one of them. For each one of them. God created man to relate with God. Satan came and destroyed our relationship between God and man. Then God created man to relate with the woman. Then Satan also came and messed up that one too. Then God created man to relate with churches. And, and we're going to solve this and that. You, you see that there's an enemy that is invisible, but that fights relationships. Before we talk about that enemy, let's ask ourselves, why is God putting you, why, why is God interested in giving you good relationships? Number one, salvation is released through a relationship with God. For you to be in heaven, it's because you know God. That you have to have a relationship with God for you to even make it to heaven. John 17 verse 3, and this is eternal life that they may know you the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is eternal life. What is eternal life? That you may know God and you may know Jesus Christ whom he sent. So salvation itself is impossible outside a relationship with God. You have to know God. You have to know God for you to be saved. For you to have eternal life. And this is very true about a lot of things in your life. There are certain things you can never have about a person until you know them, until you are relating with the person. There are things that I can never give you because you and I are not relating. You and I don't have a relationship. I'm trying to show right from salvation, it is relationship-based. It is relationship-based. Jesus had not done one miracle. His father says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. Relationship comes before performance. That you must be able to relate with a person first. That's the first thing. That's the first thing. Now, number two, blessings are released through relationships. Psalm 133, verse 1. Behold how good and how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. How good and pleasant it is. Psalm, Psalm 133, verse 1. Now, Psalm 133, verse 3, last verse. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mounts, the, the descending upon mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing. Love forevermore. So when, when people are together in unity, a blessing is released. A blessing is released. When a family is together in unity, a blessing is released. When a cell group is together in unity, a blessing is released. When, when, when a church leadership is together in unity, a blessing is released. When, when, when a husband and wife are together in unity, a blessing is released. There are blessings that are released when people are together in unity. Together in unity. I mean, you have Ephesians chapter 6 verse 2. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you. And that you may live long on the earth. Those are blessings, and they are connected to how you relate. How you relate. How you relate with a person. I'm trying to show you that relationships, good relationships, are supposed to be releasers of blessings into your life. Another reason why God gives you good relationships is because much gets done through good relationships. A lot of things can be accomplished when you are in relationship with somebody. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 to 12. Two are better than one. Because they have a reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. It's always, two, together is always better. I said together is better. Together is better. The mind of being alone, the mind of not mixing with others is not from God. It's not from God. Together is better. Two are better than one. You can never change this reality. I say you can never change the reality. Every time you are one, you are in a disadvantaged position. That's why he said it is not good for man to be one alone. Because two are better than one. Why? They have a better reward for their labor. 
If one fall, the other will lift him up. But woe to him who is alone when he falls. For he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie together, they will keep warm. And it is winter at the moment. It is this winter, and this winter has been hitting very hard. Oh, it's been difficult. It's been very difficult. My God. Oh. Two can keep warm. Heater can never replace the warmth of a human body. Never confuse. Even a, a blanket, an electric blanket. I bought an electric blanket that almost became a roasted chicken inside the electric blanket. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Almost died inside that thing. It can never be the same. But how can one be warm alone? How? 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 You can take all the pillows, hold the pillow. The pillow that say, I can't. I can't. In fact, I need your warmth. You are, me, I'm cold. Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So the more, the better. My father, when he was alive, he gave us an illustration one day to show us that we must always be united as a family. He took a stick and he broke it. In a second, it was broken. Then he took about five or six sticks together and he tried to break them and they were not breaking. And then he told us, whenever you are united like this, it will be very difficult for anything or anyone to break you. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? When you are alone, it's easy to break you. It's easy to destroy you. When you are moving alone, when you are thinking alone, when you are doing things alone, always alone, always alone. Satan understands that you are at, it's at his mercy when you are alone. When your relationships are not working well. When certain things that are supposed to come to you from certain relationships have been destroyed. You are weakened. You are weakened. And this morning I'm talking about uh, exposing invisible enemies that are in your relationships. Why is it that your relationships are not working? Is it because you, have, you lack social skills? That could be a reason. But you may be surprised to discover that there's more to it than you lacking social skills, than you being an introvert, or than you being an extreme extrovert. You'll be shocked that there is more to it than meets the eye. Satan understands the power of good relationships. He understands it. He knows two are better than one. He knows when you are in the right group and there's unity, a blessing will come and things will start happening to everybody. So any group that has unity, he has to fight it. Anywhere where people are having peace, he has to come there and bring disorder. He has to do that. That is how he operates. The very first relationship we know in our dispensation, established by God, was destroyed by no other than himself. Genesis 3, 13 to 14. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? What is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent. The serpent. She introduced somebody. She said, the serpent deceived me. The serpent, the first relationship God ever established. In the book of Genesis chapter 3, we haven't gone anywhere. We are introduced to an enemy, an invisible enemy. You know, the whole time Adam and Eve were in the garden, I think, I think they thought they were alone. They thought, they were, I mean, this is our place, we are enjoying ourselves, there's nothing here, we are just fine. But there was an invisible enemy. By the time the serpent was done, if relationship with God was destroyed, if relationship with her husband was destroyed, they started accusing each other. It had, it had never recovered from that one. If relationship with herself was destroyed, she became naked. She saw herself naked. She started having, you know, everything changed. But one encounter with an invisible enemy. That's why Jesus 
spent a lot of time working on his disciples. He worked on them a lot. He didn't work much with the crowds. He worked a lot more with his disciples. People that he knew God gave him. He told God that the people you've given me, there are people God has given you. There are people God has given you. Are you taking time to work on those relationships that people God gave you? Because we find Jesus saying, of all you've given me, I didn't lose even one, except the son of perdition. And as you're going to see now, the attacks that came in those his relationship with his disciples were not small at all. Jesus says in John 15, 15, I no longer call you servants because the servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. So Jesus built a relationship. When he started his relationship with his disciples, they were servants. They were just errand boys that were assisting him there and there and then. That's how the relationship started with them. But he worked on the relationship. He worked on the relationship until the status of the people changed in the relationship. I don't think when Adam, when Abraham married Sarah, she was calling him her Lord. But as Sarah kept seeing this man, she kept seeing what is going on with this man. She looked at him and they said, no, this is not my husband. This is my Lord. This man cannot just be my husband. There's more to him than just a husband. And I believe one day she looked at him again and said, no, this is not even my Lord. This is my father. This man is like a father to me. Many relationships never get to go from servant to friend. From husband to Lord. From Lord to daddy. Most of, most of these people that you see, they've been together for many years. If you check deeply, you find out that the woman is now calling the husband a daddy. And the husband is calling the wife mommy. The whole thing has evolved so much. They have gone through so many stages in their relationship that the relationship has matured. The real purposes of the relationships are now being expressed. I do not call you anymore my servants. In other words, it's at duty level, duty level. This is just for duty. You come to sell, you come to church, and we relate as duty levels. He said, I call you now my friends. Why, 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 why? For everything that I learned from my father, relationship, I have made known to you. Everything I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. Everything I have learned, I have shared myself with you. Everything I know, I have made known to you. So you are no more just a servant. A servant doesn't know what the master is doing. You are not a friend. You are not a friend. The relationship has improved. So Jesus moved the 12 disciples from just boys, errand boys, servants, people you send around, to friends, people you can move with, people you can relate with. That was a higher level. That was a higher level. And that is where God wants all our relationship to go to. When you meet Jesus, when you meet God, God is just your God. Just your God, he provides your ATM. He, he does things for you. He takes the idea. But when you mature in him, there's a level he becomes your Lord. You realize that even yourself, he, you, he owns you. Everything about you, he owns it. He is no more just your savior. He is also now your Lord. He's your Lord. The whole thing has changed. It has changed. I'm saying many relationships never graduate from that le- the first level to the next level. The husband is forever the husband. The wife is forever the wife. In fact, it degrades, as you're going to see now, because Satan came to attack two major people in this group that Jesus was working on. He attacked them heavily. The first one he attacked was Judas. John 6, verse 17, the Bible says, Jesus answered and said, didn't I choose you? All, you two, all of you, I chose you, and you have become my friends. And one of you is a devil. Jesus didn't say one of you has a devil. There's a difference. He didn't say one of you has a devil. He said one of you is a devil. In other words, you've gone from servants, to friend, 
from friend to devil. What a shock. You've gone from, you've gone from servant, in fact, you've gone from a nobody to a servant. From a servant, you became a disciple. From a disciple, you became a friend. From a friend, instead of becoming an apostle, like the others, you have become a devil. You become a devil. Matthew 16, verse 23. But he turned and said to Peter, that's another one, another one of his disciples, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. Wow. This one went from nobody to disciple, from disciple to friend, from friend to offense. You are an offense to me. You are an offense. Somebody I have taught everything I know, somebody I have raised has become an offense. And Jesus is mentioning Satan. You, there's somebody who has worked on you. The other guy said you have become, a de- you have become the devil himself. The same serpent that we saw in Genesis that destroyed the relationship of Eve with God, her relationship with her husband, the same serpent is mentioned in these beautiful relationships that Jesus was having with his 12 disciples. The same serpent. Exposing invisible enemies in your relationships. Exposing them to you for you to see What's actually going on? Yes, sir. You to see what is going on. It's important to notice that prior to Peter becoming an offense to Jesus, Peter was actually one of Jesus' best assistants. I mean, that's Genesis, that is Matthew 16, 23. If you go to Matthew 16, I think at 13, at 17 and 18, just five verses above, Jesus is saying to Peter, blessed are you. Simon Barjona, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I mean, just five verses earlier, this guy is such a wonderful assistant. He is so helpful. He is in tune with his leader. He knows what his leader wants. He understands everything about the leader. Five verses later, he is now a devil. He is an offense. He's an offense. What do we value more in this life than money? Yet Jesus gave his money back to Judas. What a level of trust he had in the man. Do you believe that Judas betrayed Jesus because of money? The very same thing Jesus had entrusted him with. It is the very same thing he used to betray Jesus. I saw a picture during the week that shocked me. It was a picture of a very, very famous American hip-hop star that died years ago, Tupac. It was a picture of Tupac. There was a lady next to him and there were three guys behind him. And the caption of the picture was, a man surrounded by his enemies. The girlfriend by his side is the one who took him to court to claim that he raped her. Behind him, the manager was the one who was stealing money from him. Next to the manager was the producer who was, I mean, every, the, the, the caption said, everybody around the guy in that picture were all, and, and in fact, the friend, the best friend was the far right. He's the one who orchestrated his death. His death. Tupac. There are a lot of Tupacs out there. You're moving around, you're thinking that these are my friends, these are people that are with me, yet the person next to you is orchestrating your downfall. Jesus says, Peter, you are an offense. You have become an offense to me. You are an offense to me. You have become an offense to me. You have become an offense. But this thing that happened to Peter was no surprise because Jesus told him that Satan is checking you. Satan is checking you out. Luke 22, verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you. Satan is requesting you. 
that he may sift you as wheat. Satan is requesting you. Like, he can see that you, you seem to be the person that I'm putting my hopes on. Satan never went for Andrew. Satan never went for Bartimaeo. Satan never went for Luke. Why? He went for the main people that Jesus had. This is a message to anybody that is assisting at a certain level. You must know, Satan will ask for you. Satan will ask for your heart. Satan will ask for you. You must know if you are assisting somebody very closely. You are assisting somebody very closely. And Satan can see that he cannot hit the person. He understands that if I cannot hit the main person, I can hit the main assistant. If was... Adam's main assistant. You must understand that say, ah, the snake never went for Adam, even for one second. But he wanted the place of Adam. That is what he actually wanted. But he didn't go for Adam. He went to the assistant, the main assistant of Adam, who was Eve. And he took her down. And by taking her down, he took Adam down. He took Adam down. So by the time Judas was down, by the time Peter was down, guess what? Jesus was down. The man was on the cross, dying. Everything was finished. Because the assistants were down. The moment bit, the devil managed to take Judas down. Judas even told him, I will, I will give him to you. I, I know how to get him. I know where he goes. I know exactly. I will, leave, I will deliver him into your hands. Many assistants have delivered their leaders into the hands of the enemy. Many husbands, many wives have delivered their families into the hands of the enemy. Because when the enemy is knocking, they are not aware. They are not aware. They are not aware. Jesus is saying to Peter, Satan has requested for you. You don't understand that you are in a position where the enemy will want you to. If he cannot get me, the next person to get will be you. The next person to get will be you. And I pray for you this morning that he will never get you in the name of Jesus. That's why this word has come. Everything that happened, happened so that we can learn from it. Every major assistant, if you are a wife, you are the main assistant of that man. You must know that if Satan never went for Adam, but went for Eve, by all means, Satan will come for you. He will come for you. He will come for you. May he find you ready. May he find you prepared. Arm to the teeth. Every assistant pastor, every assistant cell leader, you must know that the snake will come for you. He will come for you. He will come for you. Take your seat in the presence of the Lord. So my little talk this morning, I haven't actually spoke what I want to talk. Let me not tell you what I want to say this morning. What I want to tell you this morning is what do we call this thing? That somebody starts well. He even gets promoted to becoming a friend. He even gets promoted to becoming the builder of the church. And then becomes an offense. What do we call this transformation? Somebody starts as a nobody becomes a disciple, becomes a treasurer, end up becoming a devil. What do we call this? There's a name for it. We call it disloyalty. That is the name. That is the name of that whole thing you are seeing there. It has a name. The name is what? Disloyalty. Let me give you my definition of disloyalty. This is my own definition based on my understanding so far. Disloyalty is a dramatic change in attitude and behavior inspired by evil spirits and leading to a sour deterioration and painful loss of a good relationship. I want to read it again for you. A dramatic change in attitude and behavior 
inspired by evil spirits and leading to a sour deterioration and a painful loss of a good relationship. A good relationship that has deteriorated sourly and that has ended with a lot of pain. What do you call it when it happens? What do you call it? It is called disloyalty. Disloyalty starts happening when evil spirits gain access to a person's mind and start suggesting negative thoughts to them. Disloyalty starts happening when evil spirits gain access to a person's mind and start suggesting evil thoughts to the person. Acts 5, 3, the Bible says, Peter said to Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? So Satan can fill the heart. But what is the heart? Jesus somewhere else says that, why do you think such evil thoughts were in your heart? That is Matthew 9, verse 4. Why do you think such evil thoughts in your heart? Peter is saying to Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart? So what was going on in the heart of Ananias? Thoughts. There were certain thoughts that were being given to him. And those thoughts were not thoughts of Ananias himself. Those thoughts were inspired by the devil. And, and Ananias is thinking, it is him thinking, but he doesn't know that Peter is revealing to him that actually those thoughts that have led you to these actions. By the way, he died that day. That guy died that day. And his wife also, his wife also died that same day. Do you understand? That these actions that you have not done were inspired by Satan. But how did he do it? How did he do it? He inspired thoughts, evil thoughts in your mind. When evil thoughts are not dealt with, they lead to great destruction. Let me submit to you this morning that your greatest sign that Satan is around, your greatest sign that an evil spirit is, in, has, is already moving around you, is not you shaking, it's a thought. It's a thought. It's a thought. It's a thought in your mind. A thought in your mind is the greatest sign of a spiritual attack. Your worst spiritual attack is not even something hitting your body. Your worst spiritual attack is an evil spirit in your mind. It's a thought in your mind. It's an evil thought in your mind that you are taking lightly. When a thought enters your mind, an evil spirit has entered your mind. Praise the Lord. When an evil spirit enters your mind, how do you know? Your thoughts. Your thoughts. How has Satan so filled your heart? Why do you think such evil thoughts in your heart? So that's the connection. Your worst attack is an evil thought. It's an evil thought. An evil thought. An evil thought that you are not doing something about is going to grow. It's going to grow. And more thoughts will come because thoughts work together. Evil spirits are always... The greatest teams on earth are not soccer teams. The greatest teams on earth are not basketball teams. They are demons teams. Demons never work alone. In fact, there's a demon. You know about this guy. He, he, he was evicted from a house went around, came back, found the house was still his, and he didn't enter and say, ah, I'm going to now stay here alone. He went and got seven more. That tells you the mentality of evil spirits. They prefer being together. They seem to want being together more than us. Like, they, they inspire us to not be together, but they like being together. You will find a person that he has a lot of demons in them, and the demons are inspiring him to not join anybody, yet those demons in him are always together. They are always ganging together. 
The very thing they don't want you to do is what they are doing. They inspire you to live here. Don't go there. Don't talk to this one. Yeah, they are always talking. They are very, I mean, very rarely do you see a person being delivered and it's only one demon. The madman of God, there are 6,000. I mean, what, what else do you want as a proof that these guys like being together? They, they hate us being together, but they like being together. They like being together. Somebody is being helped this morning by the Spirit of God. I said somebody is being helped this morning by the Spirit of God. So when demons, when these evil thoughts are allowed to enter your mind, because you need to understand how Judas became Judas. Satan entered Judas, the Bible says. And when Satan enters you, how does he enter you? Man, your thoughts. He starts inspiring you to do certain things. He starts advising you to do, he starts suggesting certain things to you. And all the things he's suggesting to you are falling into four different realms. Number one, lies. Number two, deceptions. Number three, delusions. Number four, seduction. Those are the four things he brings your way. He will use lies, he will use deception, he will use delusions, and he will use seduction. By the time he's done, your mind has been rearranged, if you are not careful. And once your mind gets rearranged, your tendencies start changing. They start changing. What are some of the tendencies of a person whose mind is under the influence of evil spirit? Those who forget, those who forget are under the influence of evil spirits. Because that's where they come first. They come to the mind and they start causing you to declare anything that is there that can keep you in a certain position and they introduce other things to your mind. That's why people who forget are very dangerous people. You, you might think that forgetting, in fact, I have come to realize that the, all the activities of Satan begins with making you forget. It's, it, the other ones are just, you know, by the way. But the main thing Satan does when he enters your mind is to make you first forget anything good that was done for you. It's to clear anything nice that was done for you. And to bring up all the bad that was done to you. It is the man of God, young Gichua, blessed me with that said that it seems like human beings, when you do something for them that is good, they write it on sand. When you do something that is bad, they write it on a stone. But what he didn't know was that actually it is not the human being, it's the devil that makes you forget all the good so quickly, but he doesn't allow you to forget the evil that was done for you. The same person that is forgetting the good, it seems to never forget the evil. How come you don't forget the evil? You only forget the good. No, it's the work of evil spirits, my friend. Work of evil spirits. Hebrews 6 verse 10. God is not unjust to forget. To forget. People who forget are unjust. In other words, they are unfair. It's unfair that you are remembering this, but you are forgetting this. It's unfair. It's unfair that you are, you are not remembering. You are only remembering what was done that was wrong. But you are not remembering the other good things that were done. It is unjust. It is unjust. And it is unfair. But it is the work of evil spirits. When evil spirits are in your mind and evil thoughts are in your mind, you will start forgetting. You forget the people who helped you. Psalm 103 verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not. Forget not. All his benefits. What is he saying? For, don't forget the things you benefited in the relationship. Don't forget the good things that were done for you in the relationship. Because when you forget them, you are opening yourself to other things that are coming. Will you agree with me? Judas forgot he was chosen. Judas was just in the group there. Do you know the day Judas was chosen, there were a lot of other people. Because the Bible says Jesus chose. How can you choose if there is no alternatives? For Judas to be chosen, a lot of people were left out. Judas forgot that. He forgot that he was a nobody. Who knew his name? Who knew Judas is carried in this world? Who knew him? He forgot. He forgot that, by the way, me that is not being inspired to go and betray this man. I exist because of this man. He forgot that. He forgot that. He forgot that 
This man put him in charge of the whole money of his ministry. Do you know what that means? And the guy was even stealing money. And God knew what he was, Jesus knew he was stealing, but Jesus still trusted him. He forgot that Jesus forgave him many times for stealing. When people misbehave, it is always because they forgot a lot of things. That's why God says you don't forget the benefits. The day you forget the benefits, you start misbehaving. He told the Israelites, when you enter this land, a lot of good things are going to start happening to you. But when those things start happening, don't forget the Lord your God. It is him who gave you the power to get the wealth. Don't forget him. Because it is easy. After things start changing, you forget who brought you where you are. You forgot who brought you, who, who raised you. You forget. Korah forgot he was a slave. The day Korah is addressing Moses as his equal, he says to Moses, you are making yourself too big. Who told you that you are so great? Korah was a slave carrying rocks in Egypt. He was a nobody. God brought a person. The person has done miracles. When, when, when Moses is doing the miracle, Korah doesn't even, it, his name doesn't even come up. We don't know him. But in the wilderness, Korah rises and starts facing Moses. Wow. Wow. People who forget. People who forget. Hmm? Am I talking to somebody here this morning? You forget. Before you take the step, just ask yourself, have I taken into consideration all the benefits? Have I considered all the benefits as I'm taking this step now? I'm being suggested to go and betray my master. But have I taken into consideration that I was a nobody? He has chosen me. He has done this for me. He has done this for me. You will always notice when people start misbehaving, it is because they forgot a lot of things. Never undermine the power of forgetting. Never undermine it. A lot of us undermine it. That's why you never take time to remember. And, and, and you see, thanksgiving helps you to not forget. When you can sit in your bed and say, Lord, thank you for this. Thank you for this. I didn't even have a room. Now I have a house. I didn't have a, I didn't have a bicycle. Now I have a car. I didn't have even a bread. Now I have a whole kitchen. And when you start thanking God, it will help you to not backslide. It will help you a lot. It will keep you in check. People that backslide forget. I was a sinner. I was a nobody. I had nothing. God has helped me. God has restored me. They forget that. God cleansed them. Now they become bigger than God. God blessed them. Then they become richer than God. God elevates them. They become higher than God. Satan forgot he was created. A creation that is not claiming the position of the creator. You, 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 if something, something must have gone wrong in your mind. So you forgot something. You forgot something. You forgot something. You forgot something. Many wives forget that they were never going to be married. And I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. Do you know how many people slept with you? Why didn't they marry you? They slept with you and left. They slept with you and left. And God sent a person and he says, I will not sleep with you. I will marry you. Then you start disrespecting such a person. You start misbehaving in the I mean, people that used to slap you, they sleep and then they slap you and then you are still begging them. Today, God sends somebody that honors you. Then you forget who you were. You forget what you used to be. You forget that you had no name. You, you, I mean, you were just a nobody. Many people forget. Many children forget what their parents have done for them. Ham forgot. He was supposed to die like everybody in the flood. One mistake his father makes, he tells the whole world. He tells the whole world. Are you listening to me today? Yeah. Forgetting is by far your greatest mistake. Is by far. I'm telling you now, I'm telling you today that if God will help you, that's why one of the major work of the Holy Ghost is to bring to your remembrance. Satan makes you forget. The Holy Ghost helps you remember. Helps you remember. 
no, 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 don't forget this, don't forget this, don't forget this, don't forget this. Don't forget that that church, you were, not, you were going to hell. You were on your way to hell. You were going to be roasted, bry. You were going to be kebab for evil spirits. God used a man. That man could have preached about something else, but he preached about salvation. You are forgetting that pastors can preach about anything. There are pastors that don't preach about salvation at all. You can be in a church for a thousand and you will never be given an opportunity to be saved. But God sent a man and the man cared for your soul. And the man preached salvation, pure salvation to you. The man told you how you can be born again. He helped you. Today you are saved. Today you are speaking in tongues. Today you know where to find a podcast. Today you know where to find things. Today you know how to go on YouTube and find things. All of a sudden, he becomes nothing. He becomes nothing. He becomes nothing. You can't remember him. I want to end by telling you about the chief butler. Chief butler found himself in prison with the chief car bearer. Both of them have a dream. One sees birth, one sees this. A young man in the prison called Joseph interpret the dreams for both of them. To the chief butler, to, oh no, Pharaoh's going to restore you to your position. To the baker, he said, look, look you're going to die. True to the word, the chief butler is released. But before he leaves, Joseph says to him, please, when you go high, when, when, you, become, when you become great, when you are elevated, please remember me because I was thrown here by mistake. I'm not supposed to be here. I don't deserve to be here. Please remember me. He said, ah, no, no, don't worry, don't worry. Hey, after what you've done for me. No, 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 I will never forget. In, in fact, as soon as I go, I'm going to, I'm going to have a one-on-one a, 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 a -on -one with Pharaoh. And I'm going to tell him, yeah, there's a power in the prison. The guy is too powerful. You must raise him up. Now, I will never forget. I will never, me. No, 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 I'll never forget. Genesis 40, verse 23. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. For God. Many people don't remember those who helped them, you know. <laughs> they don't remember. They don't remember. And, and you think it's a small thing. It's not a small thing. Because when later in Genesis 41, verse 9, then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I remember my faults this day. So the chief butler became aware that actually what he did was very wrong. He says, I remember my faults. I remember my faults. I remember my faults. I remember my mistake. That's what he's trying to say. If forgetting was not a, a mistake, if forgetting was not a fault, why is he saying, I remember my faults? If forgetting was not a bad thing. That Joseph remained in that prison for two more years. And Joseph could have died in that prison in those two more years if God didn't help him. If God didn't help him. Are you listening to me? So I'm telling you this morning, be careful. Be careful. When Satan enters your mind, one of the main things that he starts doing, he causes you to forget. The good things that were done for you, the good words that were spoken for you, the help that was given you, you forget it. You forget that your first sermon came from that small church. That's where that you forget that this person is the one who gave you an, an opportunity to stand on stage the first time. Who ever gave you that opportunity before? Who ever even thought that you can hold the microphone? Today you can hold the microphone and people are jumping. And you forget where it's coming from. Those who forget are under heavy demonic influence. Heavy demonic influence. And I pray for you this morning by the mercies of God that you will not be among those who forget. That that tendency will leave you today by the grace of God. That you will never find yourself forgetting what your mother did for you. 
forgetting what your father did for you, forgetting what your uncle did for you, forgetting what your pastor did for you. All these people God brought into your life at specific times, you are forgetting them because now your things are better. Your things are better. You are forgetting the people that were there when your things were not good. You are forgetting them. Chief Butler, you are forgetting that there's a young boy in the prison. He's the reason why you still have a job. He's the reason why nobody knows him in the palace, but he's the reason why you still have a job. He's the reason why you still have a job. He's the reason. He's the reason. Your mother might not have taken you to school, but she's the reason why you are alive. She's the reason why you are alive. You are forgetting that. Now I'm aware that there's a lot going on and a lot of parents are misbehaving. But I want to tell you something. You see, you have to understand that David was a child. His father, Jesse, was an old man. Yet a father forgot him when there was an opportunity. It needed special grace for David to even be there. But David never kept that to his heart. What type of father is this? You are abandoning me in the field. The youngest, I'm left in the field and all the bigger ones are here and if it wasn't God, would you agree that Jesse was irresponsible? Yet David was stronger than that. David was stronger than the irresponsibility of his father. I'm talking to somebody here. That your father is displaying a lot of irresponsibility. Your mother is displaying a lot of irresponsibility. Because you are feeling that they're supposed to be the ones that are strong. But there are days when it is not the father that is strong. It is that the child that becomes stronger. And the child can handle things that, I mean, that, I mean the, the boy is supposed to just be pampered. But he's fighting giants. While the big guys are watching. Many of you are David, but you don't know. You don't know that you are David. You don't know that you are wanting, you are wanting to be pampered. But God said, no, I didn't create you to be pampered. If I wanted somebody to be pampered, I wasn't going to put you in the situation I put you to. You are David. In other words, nobody might pamper you in this life, but you are a giant slayer. You are supposed to kill giants. You are supposed to achieve a lot of things. So you don't have time to be loved. You don't have time to be taken care of. You don't have time to be given courage. You don't have that time. That's not for you. David, if you're going to be king of Israel, if you're going to be the name that people will remember, you must know that there will be opportunities where you will not, they will not mention your name. And they still call you to go and give them bread. They still call you to go and take care of them. And you will be the one to deliver the whole nation. The person that was forgotten in the bush. My mother didn't remember me. But that's right. David was not remembered. Yet David was called by God. Whose approval are you after? The approval of your mother or the approval of God? Who are you actually after at the end of the day? Who are you after? Because if it is about the approval of your mother, then I understand your frustration. I understand your anger and I understand your hurt. David said, my father and my mother have forsaken me. But my God, my God will remember me. And at the end of the day, it is David we remember in that whole story. We don't remember any of his brothers. We remember the person God remembered. Not the person the father and the mother remembered. You are seeking for the approval of your father and your mother. I hope they will remember you really. Listen to me today. You are stronger than you think. That's why God gave you a weak father. You are stronger. That's why God gave you a weak mother. A mother that has become a child. Meanwhile, you are supposed to be the child. She is the child. It's because you are stronger. Don't take it the other way. Understand because you are stronger. I am stronger. That's why I have become the father and the mother when I'm supposed to be the child. I am stronger. I'm supposed to be the one taking care of but I'm the one taking care of these people. I am stronger. I am stronger. I am stronger. I will not continue expecting things that will never come my way based on my calling, based on my assignment. Thank you, Jesus. Lift your hands and start thanking God this morning. That the grace of God has located you this morning. The mercy of God has located you this morning. You shall not forget your God. 
you shall not forget the good that has been done to you. It is David who says, bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not. God has remembered you when everybody rejected you. Forget not your God. Forget not his benefits. Forget not the good things God has done for you. Forget not the good things God has done for you. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Ah, how can you forget that you are in the bush? You are in the bush and your father forgot you. Your mother forgot you, but God remembered you. How can you forget the help that was made available for you when you needed it the most? How can you forget? How can you forget? Jesus, help us this morning. Help us this morning. Help us this morning to be those who remember. 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 Because those who remember will build lasting relationships. Those who remember, those who remember will still be in that relationship. Those who remember, but those who forget will be destroyed by these evil thoughts. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. I am a Father, forgive us for forgetting you. Forgive us for forgetting the people you brought our way to help us. We have abandoned them. We don't even talk to some of them. We don't even greet some of them. Yet, they were a very important part in our lives at some stage. How can that be right? How can that be a good thing? That you are forgetting all the people that helped you. How can that be a good thing? How can that ever be a good thing? That is the work of demons. Satan forgot who God is. Satan forgot that God made him. God gave him power. God gave him glory. God anointed him. It is God who gave him everything he had. It is God who gave him the position he had. He forgot. Satan forgot and became a rebel. May I never forget. May I never forget. May my heart be kept from evil thoughts. May my heart be protected against evil thoughts. Hey, I'm a shaka tapalamandaraba. In Jesus' precious name, we have given thanks. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. Thank you for washing us, revealing to us a lot of things that were beginning to fall off. I believe somebody's marriage is being restored right now. I believe somebody's relationship with God is being restored right now. I believe somebody's heart is being healed right now. I believe somebody's relationship with his father, his mother, is being healed and restored right now. As God is helping us. As God is helping us. And next week we are continuing with these tendencies of evil spirits at work in people's hearts, in people's minds. Please don't miss it. This morning before I go, I want to pray for you. Don't forget your salvation. Don't forget that Jesus came to die for your sins. Don't live as if there is no tomorrow. It's a big mistake. The Bible says God so loved the world. God so loved you that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for you. Don't forget the sacrifice of Jesus. This morning I want to talk to somebody and I want to encourage you to open your heart to this awesome sacrifice that was shared 2,000 years ago at Golgotha. If you are saying, Pastor, I want to be born again. I would like my sins to be forgiven. I want God to come into my heart. I'd like to pray for you right now. At the count of three, just raise your right hand and Pastor will pray with you. One, two, three. Raise it up. God bless you. God bless you. You can take your hands down. Now you're already born again, but this morning you feel like recommitting yourself to Jesus. I also want to pray for you. At the count of two, please raise your right hand. One, two, three. Raise it up. God bless you. God bless you. Pray with me this morning. Dear Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you today. Please forgive me my sins. Wash me with your blood. I believe you died for me. On the third day you rose again. That I might be justified. Right now, I believe my sins are forgiven. I'm justified by your blood. I'm saved. I'm restored. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. I am free from the power of sin to serve the living God. Thank you, Jesus, 
for receiving me. Thank you, Jesus, for restoring me. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I stretch my hand and I pray for every single person watching this morning. I ask, Father, let your grace locate each one of them. Let your mercy wash us. Let your blood cleanse every sin and renew every life. But I ask that you will write every name in the book of life and cause us to be planted in the church that we will be unmovable, stable believers in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you.